Man Church. Man Church is a mentoring tool. It's reaching and teaching men, ministering as men in the community. Statistics tell us that only 39% of total worship attenders are men. Man Church will present God's directives and influences in a way that men can relate to, man to man and face to face. Jason Elam in his career is 223 of 239. That is a 93% conversion rate. I never wanted to be remembered for, for uh, making a long field goal and then coming back and, and missing you know, a game winner or something. I wanted my teammates to trust that if the game came down to a game winning field goal that you know, they wanted me on the field. And that made me feel great when I was, I remember running out on the field and guys already celebrating. I mean, that, that is what made me feel good. I went to a, a varsity football game in high school one night and the kicker there was, he was kind of struggling a little bit and I thought, I think I can do that. And so the next year I went out for the team and it was a lot harder than what I thought. I could kick it a long way, but I had no idea where it was going. And so that just drove me and drove me to try to get better and better. And fortunately I did get a little bit better before going off to college. I never thought that I'd be drafted by the Denver Broncos in the third round by any stretch. I just saw my name going across the ESPN scroll on draft day. Uh, third round pick to the Denver Broncos. And so it was an incredible blessing to get to be drafted by the Denver Broncos. I remember early on, um, one of my very first games I ever played my rookie year, um, I missed a kick uh, kind of towards the end of the fourth quarter. The other team went right back down and scored, and we lost. And I was thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I've worked so hard for this all the way through in high school and college, and this was my dream. And I mean, I, it's probably going to be over before ever I really got started. And so I was beating myself up that whole night and on the flight back. and. Uh, uh, you know, the next morning, I, I mean, I didn't sleep very good. And so I get up and I'm thinking, you know, well, Jason, you just got to get over it. And uh, so I needed to go in town. There was a few things I needed to do. I, one was get my hair cut. And so I was sitting there and this lady, she was wanting to know everything about my life. And I was trying to avoid everything about my life that day. And, and you know, you're stuck there. You can't go anywhere. And she finally, she, she goes, what do you do? And I said, well, I play for the Broncos. And she said, oh, I'm a season ticket holder. You know, I, I love the Broncos. What position do you play? And I said, well, I'm their kicker. And she goes, oh, well, you should have been kicking yesterday. That Elam guy sucks. <laughs> so the failure thing was always, always right in front of you, you know. And so as I was preparing for this, I was like, you know, what do I want, want to talk about? And uh, what, Lord, do you want me to talk about? And I was going through Hebrews 11. I just kind of happened to be going through that. And I was thinking, this is amazing. This is really, really cool. Because when you go through Hebrews 11, that great hall of faith where it says, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Abel, by faith, Samson, by faith, you know, just list off, off all of those guys and this, this incredible faith they had. I was sitting there thinking, well, I've read the stories. I mean, that they really didn't, did they? I mean, they were a mess. They were an absolute mess, just like I'm a mess. And so why, are they, why is Hebrews 11, the, the, write, the author of that, and, and in fact the Holy Spirit who inspired this person to write that, why are they writing it like that? And then I got to thinking, I was like, you know what? So in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, right, the blood of, of bulls and goats, the, the, the yearly reminder of that failure was ever before them. They had to continually come before the Lord and make these sacrifices. Why? So they could cover the sins not take them away, but just to cover them. And then I was thinking, you know, in Jeremiah, when it talks about how there's going to be a new covenant, and this covenant's going to be better because this one's going to be something that takes the sins away completely, as if they were never there. It's going to completely wash them away. And so when I was, I was sitting there reading this, I was like, this is how God sees these people. This is how he sees Abraham and Moses and David and Jephthah and Samson. He sees them as they really are, as great people of faith, even though they had just a little bit of faith, what God can do with that faith. And so I was thinking, what an encouragement that is for me, because I feel like I'm a mess. I feel like I fail all the time. But I do, I have come to the conclusion through a lot of study and life experience that the Word of God can be relied upon, that it's valid, that it's authentic, that it's reliable, that it is actually authored by God himself. And so I was thinking, oh man, that is really cool that this is the way God sees me. This is my identity. My identity is not failure. My identity 
is child of God, right? Child of God. And so there's the pendulum that can, can take place too. On the other side, Romans 6, Paul talks about, you know, don't get so cocky now. Don't abuse that. May it never be, he says. You know, there was one guy that said, the only thing you ever contributed to your salvation is the sin that made it necessary, right? And so there's a, there's a, a, a reality there. And it's not about failure. It's not a, about failure at all. It's about trust. Do we trust the scriptures? Do we trust that God is, is going to make us into a new creation, that he is for us? It's not about ability. It's about availability, Right? So that, that, I think it's really important that we also talk just a, a few seconds about effort, right? Now, the gospel, the gospel is actually not opposed to effort. It is opposed to effort when you're trying to work for, for your salvation. But we work, for, we work from our salvation. We don't work for it, right? It's, it's a fine thing to work as hard as you possibly can to advance the kingdom, because I see, I see that it is real, and it took me a number of years. I'll, I'll tell you briefly in a minute about my story, but it took me a long time to arrive at that. I was just a nominal Christian, but I finally arrived. It, it can be relied upon, and I want to do everything in my power to tell people how much God loves them, how much he wants to make them, uh, create a new identity in them, that they are a child of God. I remember early on in my career, uh, I played for Mike Shanahan for 13 years, and he told us this story, uh, I mean, a bunch of times, but he said when he first went out to the San Francisco 49ers as the offensive coordinator, he said that he, the, the first week he was there, he went into the office, he always tried to get there at 5 a.m., and he said every morning the, the light was on in the wide receiver's room, and as he went by, it was Jerry Rice. Y'all remember Jerry Rice? And he said every morning, he'd say, well, good morning, Jerry. You know, I, you know, you're doing okay? Yes, coach. Yes, coach. And he said after about a week of this, he finally stopped in and said, Jerry, you need to be in bed. You need to get some rest. We're counting on you. He said, what are you doing up here at 4 o'clock in the morning? You've been here for a while. It's obvious. And Jerry said, coach, he said, I know that I'm getting older. And he said, I can tell that I'm slipping. And he said, I want to be the best wide receiver that has ever played the game. And he said, so I've got to figure out a way to beat my opponent. And so I'm going to watch the film on him. I'm going to figure out what his strengths are, what his weaknesses are. He said, I know what my weaknesses are now. And I've got to find that, that little thing that can give me an advantage. And he was putting in all the effort that he could. And I think that was absolutely awesome. I mean, I want to be teammates with that guy. I want to be teammates with that guy. But it's also, on the other side of that, there were... It creates uh, like a false identity, and I saw this over and over, and you see it, I think, if you pay attention to ESPN or anything going on in the sports world, you see it over and over, and it's, it's this identity issue, right? There's a horrible stat out there that within three years of being out of the NFL, that 80% of guys are bankrupt and 90% of guys are divorced, and I think it's back to an identity issue. It's, we've been told from childhood, you're a football player, you're a football player, you're a football player. All the way through, the average career in the NFL is three and a half years. Everybody thinks they're going to play forever, and then it's over. And so, who are you at that point? And this, I, many of my, my Christian b brothers in the league, my teammates, um, they really struggled with this too. It was something that really is a hard thing when you're told you are this, you are this, you are this. So, I don't know what your, your vocation is out there, that's not your identity. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you've submitted your life to him, you are a child of God. That is your identity. Amen? Amen. I actually, when I came here, I really wanted to encourage you guys, and this was something that I came across not long ago, and it was something that I, uh, really encouraged me. So I don't want you leaving here without knowing who you are in Christ, all right? Let me just tell you who you are, and these are all, every single one that I'm about to read to you is backed up scripturally. This is who you are. You are faithful. You are God's child. You've been justified. You are Christ's friend. You belong to God. You are a member of Christ's body. You can be assured that all things work together for good. You have been established. You've been anointed. You've been sealed. You can be confident that God will perfect the work that he's begun in you. You are a citizen of heaven. You are hidden with Christ in God. You have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. You were born of God. You were blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. 
You are chosen. You are holy. You are blameless. You are adopted as his child. You are in him. You have been redeemed. You are forgiven. You have purpose. You have hope. You are included. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are a saint. <laughs> you are the salt and light of the earth. You are a personal witness of Jesus Christ. You are his co-worker. You are his masterpiece. You are a minister of reconciliation. You are alive with Christ. You are raised with Christ. You are seated with Christ. You have been shown the incomparable riches of God's grace. You have peace. You have access to the Father. You are a member of God's household. You are, you are secure. You are a holy temple. You are the dwelling for the Holy Spirit. You share in the promise of Christ Jesus. You have power that works through you. You can approach God with freedom. You are completed with God. You can bring glory to God. You've been called. It just goes on and on. This is beautiful. You are not alone. You are growing. You are his disciple. You are prayed for by Jesus himself. You are united with other believers here tonight. You are not in want. You possess the mind of Christ. You have been promised eternal life. You are victorious. That's only about half of them. Be encouraged, my friends. That's who you are. That is who you are. That's what Scripture tells us. And that's one of the things I want to talk about, is that that's what Scripture says. But so what? So what the Scripture says that? Can, the question is, can it be trusted? Is that just good advice? Is it just kind of given an encouraging message? Or is it actually the Word of God? And that's where my story was. So I grew up outside of Atlanta. I went off to the University of Hawaii to play college football. They're the only ones that offered me a, scholar, a scholarship, and I thought, yeah, I can do this for four years. This is kind of cool. And so I went off to the University of Hawaii. I was born in the Bible Belt. I was in church all the time, but I had no idea what the gospel was. I really didn't. So when I, when I went out to Hawaii, 75% of my teammates uh, were Mormon. There's that massive uh, satellite campus that BYU has up on the north shore of Oahu. And so we, had, we also had the oldest team in the NCAA because all those guys had gone off on their three-year mission. They'd come back as 21, 22-year-old freshmen, and they knew their doctrine and covenants and their Pearl of Great Price and their Book of Mormon, and, and they'd tie me into a theological pretzel pretty, pretty quick at the mandatory breakfasts and lunches and dinners, and they're trying to convert me. And I knew just enough that I'm like, gosh, that, I know that that's not right, and I can't really put my finger on it. And so I could, have gone, I could have gone in one of two ways, really. I could have embraced that, and I could have converted to that. But what God did, and it's really interesting to me that God used Mormonism to bring me back to him, but it ignited something in me. I wanted to know what was true. And Hawaii was such a melting pot. I mean, we had Jehovah's Witnesses there. My best friend was, uh, was a Muslim. I had friends that were Baha'i and Zoroastrian and Hindu and Buddhist and all over the place. And I was pretty frustrated because I was thinking, this whole religion thing, this is frustrating. I don't think, it's pretty possible that none of them have any evidence behind them. So I started looking at, at things and kind of where I arrived at, it took, it took a long time. It actually took me into my NFL career for me to come full circle. But what I, what I started looking at was, if I can look at the founder of these religions and if I can look at their sacred writings, that's where it's all at. It's all going to come back to those two things. And so I started looking at, at you know, Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Smith and, you know, Buddha and, I mean, all these people and looking at their sacred writings. How do they stack up in the areas of manuscript evidence and archaeology and prophecy? Those were the, the three things I started looking at right up under the founders and the, and the sacred writings. And I was frustrated because none of them stacked up. There was really no evidence behind anything. And I finally came back to Christianity, and I was thinking, this is probably going to be more of the same. And then all of a sudden, the evidence began to just stack up and stack up and stack up to where I was in awe. I started looking at the 5,686 manuscripts, Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, compared to hardly anything from any, anywhere else. I started looking at uh, the 24,000 other uh, uh, manuscripts from antiquity that we have, extant copies. I started looking at, at extra-biblical uh, things that support uh, manuscripts from people outside of Scripture that confirm the biblical narrative. I started looking at archaeology, these places in, in the Holy Land that they're there. They've been excavated. We can walk through them, and it completely supports what Scripture said. Then I started looking at prophecy, and I'm like, well, you know, 70% of, of Scripture is prophecy. Well, how many... How many times were they right? Well, they were right every single time when I started looking at it. Deuteronomy says that if they were wrong one time, that they were to be stoned. They had to be right 100% of the time. And I was just thinking, this is amazing. And so when I started 
uh, uh, adding up all of the evidence. It was, any, any lawyers in the house here? Any, anybody? We got a couple here. I was trying to develop that case. I was trying to build that cumulative case. So if you, know, if you see, a, say you have a, a body and a, and a knife right next to it, you know, that really doesn't tell you a whole lot other than there's, there's some type of connection probably. But when you start looking at it and there's blood on there and there's fingerprints on it and there's DNA on it and there's a, maybe a footprint next to it and, and you start adding up all this evidence, before long you can say, this is what happened. You may not have a complete picture, but beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is what happened. And that's the way I feel like we were, I, was, I was arriving at it with Scripture. It became everything to me. Just, I, I had a craving for it. I wanted to know more about it because everything that I looked at it, it was true. It was valid. It, it could be verified. And so, you know, um, I had a chance actually to, in the Wheel of Fortune, you know, remember the show? I think it's actually still on, isn't it? The Wheel of Fortune. So I had a chance to go on Wheel of Fortune uh, a number of years ago. And I was on with, it was like an NFL celebrity thing. And I was there with uh, Franco Harris, the Pittsburgh running back, and Terrell Owens, the 49ers wide receiver. That's who I was competing against. And so the first puzzle that came up, it's, all it said was event. And so I got to go first, and I, I was spinning that wheel, and, you know, I got a couple of letters turned over. And then I think it was my third spin, I went bankrupt. And I was like, oh, man. So it went down to Franco. And all of a sudden, he started spinning. He gets on a roll, and he's, he's turning letters over, a bunch of letters. And, and all of a sudden, it just hit me. I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I knew what the puzzle was. So I'm a, I was a field goal kicker, right, in the NFL. The puzzle was record-breaking field goal. That was the puzzle. And so the rest of the show, the whole studio audience and Pat Sajak and Vanna, they were making fun of me the whole, you know, the rest of the time. But I didn't have, in my defense, I didn't have many of the, of the uh, puzzle, the letters turned over, right? But once it started to, to uncover it, I was like, that's it. The whole puzzle wasn't turned over when Franco uh, solved it, but there was enough there. So I still have a lot of questions about Scripture. I still have lots of questions. I'm sure a lot of you do. But we have so much evidence to make sure that we have, it's not a blind faith. God has not given us a blind faith. He's completely, completely revealed himself to us in nature, in creation, the heavens declare his majesty, Scripture. I mean, it, it's, it's stunning to me. And so I arrived at the point where I was like, I got to be all in. I don't want to just be this nominal Christian guy where I bring Jesus out at certain times. I was like, this is true. And if it's true, I've got to be all in with this. This message is absolutely amazing. And so, you know, I feel like, I feel like there's, there's those people that really search for truth and they try to pursue Christ with everything that they've got. It's like their treasure, right? I'm, I've, I've been trying to help the seed company, which is a, an offshoot of, uh, of Wycliffe. Back in 1993, uh, the, the, the founder of the seed company, he was looking at when Bible poverty would be uh, completed, and it was 2150 was when they were estimating the completion of all the languages in the world, 2150. And he said, that is, that is not okay. We've got to figure out something. And so he had this idea of how to use the indigenous people around the world, the nationals, in a much more efficient way. And it became known as the Seed Company. He did a trial with 10 languages, and it went so incredibly fast. And they were still able to do all the exegetical checks and the, the back translations to ensure clarity and accuracy and naturalness of the language and acceptability in there. And it completely accelerated things to this whole other level. The Seed Company is, has just entered the 1500th language since 1993. It's accelerating so fast that we're believing that by the year 2025 that every nation, every tribe, every tongue will have at least a portion of Scripture in a, in a language that they can understand, whether it's sign language, whether it's an oral language, or whether it's a, a printed text. And we also believe that by the year 2033, all, well, all of the translation agencies, the top ten, have, have been collaborating and working together, which is beautiful to show that unity, right, that teamwork, which is so vital, they believe by the year 2033, just 14 and a half years from now, that all languages, all nations, all tongues are going to have uh, at least a full Bible. 90, 90, well, 95% will have a full Bible. 99.9996 will have a full New Testament. And you may say, well, why don't you just round up? But that point zero 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 four represents 2 million people. And we believe that God wants every nation, every tribe there. 
He wants everybody to know his message of love. And so by the year 2033, we believe that 100% of all nations, all tribes, will have at least the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel of John in a language that they can understand. And that fires me up. I am incredibly excited to see that. And so I want to pursue that. I want to pursue that like it's, like it's gold and treasure because this has become my, my treasure. Scripture has. I see the nationals around the world, the passion that they have when they get Scripture in their heart language, how they just hold it and they don't want to let it go, how they are willing to die for it. And I believe you guys are actually going to be it's one of your initiatives here at Indian Trail, um, the, the people group in Azerbaijan that you guys have been uh, uh, trying to help support. And so it's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. And I've been trying to advocate for the seed company for quite a while now. You know, we also, as far as uh, pursuing truth, though, how, how we pursue it, there's also that, there's like that hardened, really hardened group. I was over in England for a year and, and spent some time with, uh, in Europe doing some evangelism. And, man, there is some militant people that, out there. They don't want this to be true at all. But there's one thing I also think is even more dangerous, and I think it's infiltrated a lot inside of the Christian church here in America, is just this apathy of, eh, I'm just, I like my life, and, you know, it, eh, it doesn't really matter. You know, there's the, the people that identify themselves as the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, they, there's no religious affiliation whatsoever. I think that is a really scary thing. Paul talks about imploring people. <laughs> with the gospel, with compassion and truth and grace, imploring them that this is important. The pastor was just up here talking about how God uh, made a corpse alive when, you've, when you made the decision to follow Christ. You were spiritually flatlined and he breathed life into you, right? And so my confidence my confidence has never been stronger. And as the, the older I get and the more experience I have, I am convinced that it is absolutely true. And I've seen it over and over breathe life into people. It did to me. Scripture, just reading Scripture, it, it breathes life into me. We have some friends that died. Uh, their, their three daughters died in an airplane crash up in Alaska. And my friend was the one that was actually flying the plane. He survived. And all three of his girls passed away. His, his wife was with him too, and she did survive. She's, and they tell the story in, in the the days ahead, the weeks ahead, they would come out in their living room and just weep. And they would finally open up their Bible, but they couldn't see anything. They couldn't make out anything. They just wanted to die. And she said, slowly, like a word would come off the page and they would recognize the word and then a phrase. And a day or two later, they'd be able to read a couple of, of verses. And she said, it was like God was doing CPR. She said, it was literally like they, she could tangibly feel God breathing life into her. It was her respirator, she said. And so they would just constantly just lay on top of the Bible and read it and lay down and sleep. And then that was the only thing that breathed life into them. Hebrews 4.12 says that, that the word of God is alive, right? It's alive. That word is, is zao. And that, 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 that word is to experience God's life. It's not just human life. It's, just, it's this eternal, pure life from God that I want to I see everybody experience if they haven't experienced it yet. It's what gives us our identity. It's what gives us our purpose. And your purpose, I mean, we, we know what our purpose is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us our purpose. Our purpose is to be ministers of reconciliation. Our purpose is to be ambassadors of God's message, to be his representative. That's what our purpose is. Now, it's going to unfold in very specific ways for each and every one of us, uniquely, but it's also to give us a game plan. He gives us a game plan. And so this, what you guys are doing, I love what you guys are doing, meeting as men and trying to encourage each other, because we're living in a time where a lot of this is getting blurred, and we need strong leaders, strong leaders that are full of grace and truth. The reality of it, though, is that we have specific roles as men. We have specific roles. We have responsibilities that are very unique. We have a, a unique design and makeup. And there's a lot of them. I mean, just, just to list a few, we're providers, right? We're protectors. We're to control our passions. We're to be servant leaders. And that, that's, in today's world, is a little bit off, right? I mean, because a servant's not usually a leader. It's kind of an oxymoron. But 
Biblically speaking, those two are to merge together into this perfect union. And Jesus showed us how. I mean, Isaiah 53, he came to be the suffering servant, right? As the, he's the lion of Judah, the king of kings, but he came to be the surfer, suffering servant to show us how to do this. And we're also to be followers of God's design for, for masculinity, right? And I, if you look back, it really echoes what we see around, see going on today. You, it really echoes, I think, back into Genesis about uh, when Satan said, did God really say, right? Did God really say? But there is a clear design. And I love what I'm seeing here. I love what I've heard that you guys are up to. And so how do we accomplish that? How do we do that? And I, I just want to kind of leave you guys with just two thoughts, because I think it's, it's really important that we always have some type of application here. But I think the vertical relationship, number one, the vertical relationship, we've got to have our, our, our focus and our lives completely focused on God. That's that vertical relationship, to know him, to be able to absorb Scripture, not just to have, have Scripture, not just to kind of do a, a daily, you know, the daily nugget, the day, you know, uh, was it the daily bread or what? That's wonderful. But to absorb that, actually let it be transforming because God says it will renew your mind. He said, I will transform you. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 that says, uh, in the context of Moses, remember when Moses is coming down from the mountain, he was glowing but it, and he had to wear the veil. And it says, we all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord and are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. That word behold is one of the coolest words, and it's this giant Greek word that I can't really pronounce. But what it was, was a, it was a first century mirror, and it carried the context of a lady, how she would apply her makeup, and the mirrors weren't crystal clear. They were a little bit, you know, you had to like search in the mirror and find that perfect place and then stop once you find it, and you would gaze in it so intently not to lose the focus as they put on their makeup. And God's saying, look at me like that. Look at me intently. Don't take your eyes off me. And I know I take, I, I do. I mean, I, that's my confession. I take my eyes off. It's, it's a constant reminder. And, and before you know it, I'm like, what are you doing, Jason? Get your eyes back on God. Get your eyes back on what Scripture is saying. And he says he will take you from one degree of glory to another. I, I want to go from here to here all in like one day, right? But he's saying, look, it's, it's a process. And I will walk with you on it. And I will conform you into the image of my son. I will do it. Scripture will do it. It will get done. So secondly, a horizontal relationship. So that's, that's our relationship as brothers here, right? What you guys are doing right now, doing it together, not in isolation. We're doing it in community. We're developing trust with each other. It takes a long time sometimes to develop trust and, and an intimacy with people that, that you can confide in people. But that's what's happening here. Iron sharpening iron. And we're building a team that's what's happening. We're building a team so that we can gather to scatter to go tell people about God's amazing message of love. You know, there's one, there was one game in the, I think it was 350 games that I played in the NFL, but there was one time that I left the locker room and I said, there's no way that we're going to lose this game. And it was in January of 1998, we were playing the Green Bay Packers in Super Bowl 32. Super Bowl 32, where I was with the Denver Broncos and we were 14-point underdogs. The AFC had not won a game in over 14 years, won a Super Bowl in over 14 years. And no one gave us a chance at all. We had just beaten the, uh, the New York Jets two weeks before in the AFC Championship game to go. And the first meeting that we had, um, I think it was the following day, that Monday, Coach Shanahan, he came in and he said, guys, I, I know we're not going to be starting this until Wednesday, the game plan and everything. He said, but i got to show you this. He said, because I've been up all night watching film of the Packers. And he said, there is no way that you were going to lose to them. And let me show you why. And he, start, he turned on the film, and he started player by player. Gary Zimmerman, this is your strengths. This is who's going against you. There's no way over the course of a game he can hold up to what your talents are. John Elway, here's, what, here's how we're going to use you. Here's kind of how, how we're going to exploit their, their secondary. Terrell Davis, this is what we're going to do with you. Shannon Sharp, this is what we're going to do, do with you. Steve Atwood, he went player by player, and he said, you're the perfectly designed team for the Green Bay Packers. 
They cannot beat you. You're not, he said, you're not the perfectly designed team to go up against like the Minnesota Vikings of that time. He said, but the Packers, they cannot beat you. And so for the next week and a half, as we installed the game plan, we became more in and more in because we saw it. We saw exactly what he was talking about. So when we got to game game time, I remember walking out of that locker room thinking, we've got it. We've got this. Walking down the tunnel, I mean, just an enormous eruption of, of, of fans stomping on the bleachers, knowing there's two billion people about to watch this game, the biggest moment of our life, turning the corner, I was locked arm in arm with my, with my teammates, saying, I got your back. Them looking at me, saying, I got your back. We were completely united in this. And we went out, and I brought it with me, and we won our world championship. We won Super Bowl Thirty Two. As a team, it was the coolest thing ever because it was like we knew ahead of time what was going to happen. And I remember talking to some of my NFL uh, buddies recently saying, wouldn't it have been a fun career if you were just like, yeah, at the start of the the summer, you're like, I'm not going to do anything wrong to mess anything up, and we're going to go all the way through and win the Super Bowl. How enjoyable that would be. And the reason I use that illustration is because I think we're back in that today. We all, all of you, the global church, we have been united. And Jesus himself is saying, you are perfectly designed for this. I've uniquely given you gifts and talents, and you cannot fail. We are going to go win, and I'm going to lead you out on the field. And it's going to be awesome. And you're going to enjoy the time that the kingdom is advanced. And we get to do it together on the back of Jesus. So, today is the day of salvation, though, my friends. And I don't want to ever assume that everybody has already made that decision. I remember my mother tells the story back during World War II about how when she walked down the aisle to accept Jesus as a 13-year-old girl, her father got up right behind her who had been in, a leader in the church for years and years. And he later said, I never grasped it until my mother was walking that journey. And he said, I got the gospel finally. I, I was believing a completely different thing. And so I want to just pray with you guys and give you an opportunity. You know, I grew up uh, in the Bible Belt, and, and my mom always taught me to use good manners, right? Sorry, thank you, please. And so I think it can be as easy as that. There's no formula. There's no formula for getting right with, with the Lord, being reconciled with him. I think it can be as easy as sorry, thank you, please. Sorry, Lord, for the, the things I've done. Thank you for entering time for living a sinless life, for dying in my place as my sin bearer, for for raising from the dead and for now interceding for me all the time, for all of you. Did you know how encouraging is that, that Jesus himself is interceding for you to the Father? So if you just bow your heads, I just want to give everybody a chance here if they've never done that. Lord, we're so grateful, so grateful for who you are. I'm grateful for your plan to redeem us, to give us a new identity, to make us a new creation. If there's anybody out there that has never done that, Lord, or maybe there are ones that want to rededicate their lives and just say to you, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for Jesus' amazing sacrifice in my place. And Lord, please accept me. And if I may, before you raise your heads, just stay in a spirit of prayer. It's, it's not a difficult thing. It's a party breaks out in heaven when one person repents and comes to the Lord. So would you just slip up your hand if that was you tonight? Thank you, thank you. Amen. Um, 
I wasn't going to say this, but I, I, I just want to encourage you one more time, one more quick story. Um, do you remember in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen's about to be martyred? And he's, uh, he's going through a history of Israel. And as he, right before he is about to be stoned, remember the, the heavens are peeled back. And what does he see? He sees Jesus there. Now Hebrews chapter 12 talks about how Jesus, after he scorned the shame of the cross, he accomplished everything, he went and sat down at the right hand of the Father, right? But here at Stephen's martyrdom, when the heavens are peeled back, what does Stephen see? He sees Jesus standing. Jesus is up and standing and cheering him on. I sense that God is up to something huge here. We see it in the world of Bible translation. We see it around the world. We see it in the 1040 window. We see it all over the place that God is up to something huge. And he's wanting to bring us all together, I think. And he's wanting us to do it in unity. John chapter 17, when Jesus is praying for, for all the believers, for you, for unity. Because he could snap his fingers, right, and, and have it done. Just in a breath, he could have it done. But I really believe he's wanting us to do it together in unity, in collaboration, have it be a team effort. And as he does that, there's one of the, when I was in seminary, one of the coolest verses I ever came across and my Greek professors were, uh, they handed it into us. There's one spot in all of scripture. It's in Hebrews 13, five. And the way it's structured, in, in Greek, it's okay to do a double negative in Greek. We don't do that in English, but in Greek, they do it as like an exclamation point. But there's one spot, and it's Hebrews 13, 5, that it's a triple negative. Ume uk, nor, never, not, will I leave you or forsake you. Jesus is giving us a promise that he will never leave you, never forsake you. So thank you so much for letting me be here with you guys. You guys have encouraged me. I hope... Uh, I hope you guys have an awesome weekend. Um, I love what you guys are doing here with Man Church. And uh, God bless you all. Thanks.